Welcome, happy warriors, to another episode of the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, reveal how the world really works. Great to be together with you, and thank you to all of you who participate. Thank you for those who, who write in and who comment on the podcast. Uh, some of you send me information. Some of you send ideas for future podcasts. Much appreciated. Thank you very much indeed. Makes me feel very close to you. And uh, before I continue, I should tell you <laughs> that right outside where I enjoy taping the podcast, um, there is major construction going on. I am actually looking right now, not at one, not at two, but at three massive diesel hydraulic earth excavators. These are those massive machines with colossal buckets at the end of monumentally huge arms. And those buckets in one scoop, you know, gather multiple cubic yards of dirt. And uh, they're busy excavating right now. And uh, I've given up on trying to block out that noise completely. So uh, you may hear bits of it in the background. And I suggest you develop the attitude towards it that I do. You remember I've told you before that uh, Scott Fitzgerald put this basic idea very uh, beautifully in one of his essays. And that is he said the mark of a good mind is the ability to hold two conflicting ideas at the same time and to continue to be able to function. And so um, at exactly the same time, you know, I can love my child and at the same time uh, be frustrated that my child is making serious mistakes. Um, at one and the same time, I actually love the construction going on. First of all, I love how these guys, these guys who work on the construction site, they're absolute professionals. They show up on the dot of seven o'clock and the machines are up and running and they're at work and they don't stop. No lunch hours. They don't stop until they quit at about three o'clock. And during that time, they're at it and the results are visible. Literally each day I can see new concrete pilings being extended and new foundations being laid. Uh, it's, it's extraordinary to watch. And um, the, uh, the downside, of course, is the, the, the noise and the dust and uh, the um, hampering of my access roads and so on. So it's, it's two conflicting ideas at the same time. But I really do find it quite fascinating. And, and really, my, my only criticism of these construction crews is their flagrant, blatant, unforgivable sexism. Do you know that these bigoted crew bosses will not hire a single female? I mean, I look out the window and I watch, I, I suppose, I'm sure for 10 or 15 minutes a day, I actually watch the construction. Never seen a woman working on the site. Obviously, it must be sexism, right? Because the current view in the United States of America is that disparate outcomes explains is explainable only by bigotry. So if different groups of human beings uh, perform differently in different circumstances, well, obviously, it is only bigotry at work, discrimination at work, lack of equity, lack of diversity, lack of inclusion. And so clearly, those wicked people out there need to be condemned for their flagrant sexism in not choosing to hire the many women who must flock each day to the gates in the hope of being chosen to be able to work an earth compacting machine or to climb up on scaffolding onto the top of a narrow concrete piling and prefer the, and uh, organize the formwork that the crane, the tower crane, which is operated by, yes, again, a man who sits up in the little cab 200 feet off the ground, or is it, no, it's, it's, uh, it's a little less than that, 100 feet off the ground, and he, um, uh, and he's carrying 
these uh, huge canisters of pre, uh, pre-mixed pre concrete and he's placing them over and then there's three or four guys balancing and holding on with one hand onto the top of a concrete piling and they've laid the forming and now they guide this huge bucket of concrete and there's not a woman to be seen doing that work. Shocking. All I can say is that that is one evil industry. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, don't you think it would be helpful in your life to be able to predict things with some degree of certainty? Um, you know, and I mean, there's just so many different areas. I, I made a few notes of areas, but for instance, uh, you know, would would this man be a better husband for me to marry, or would that man be a better husband? They've got very different characteristics. I'm I'm seeing them both. I know them both. I think. Uh, both are probably liable to develop. Which one should I pick if I have, or oh, other way around, a guy? I mean, there's two. There's two women. I really want to get married. Which one will make me the better wife? Wouldn't you like to have some way of arriving at that conclusion? And I mean, if you ask experts, they'll just well, which one do you love more? Which you know is manifestly absurd. Um, so uh, how's about? Um, uh, the price of oil. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to be able to have s- some way of figuring out what the price of oil is going to be doing? Uh, it might help you with some investment decisions. It might help you with uh, uh, making arrangements to pre-buy fuel for the fleet of your trucks in your business. Um, and so you look and you say, well, ordinarily up till now, you know, uh, the, the price of oil um, has always worked um, in in um, uh, concert with the the dollar. How about the price of gold? You know, you've noticed that uh, inflation in the United States at the present time, and I'm taping this in uh, the middle of 2022. Inflation, official rate of inflation about nine percent. Real rate of inflation not less than 15 percent. And if you doubt that, just go to the store and look at what your money buys you, and if if you can possibly remember what it bought you three, four, five years ago, then um, you really will be, I think, in a pretty good position to know what the real price of inflation is. So ordinarily, as inflation goes up, the price of gold has typically gone up as well. Uh, In fact, gold has been a fairly good hedge against inflation. And yet, oddly enough, with inflation at certainly 15% or more, the price of gold is sort of lethargic. It's not doing a whole lot right now. And so, you know, what what is going on there? Um, Why isn't it going up? To be able to understand that, that would be useful. Or, um, uh, as I say, uh, as the, the dollar rose Typically, for years, I mean, this has been for decades, as the dollar's value went up, the price of oil went down, right? Because oil was usually denominated in dollars. And so if the dollar buys more, well, then the oil price effectively goes down in, in dollar terms. But now it's, it's weird. Um, the, the price of gold has, excuse me, the price of oil has been going up and the, the value of the dollar compared to many other currencies is still up or, or rising. So why? Why is the price of oil not going down? Wouldn't it be nice to be able to understand what's going on there with oil and with, uh, 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 with gold? Um, what's with the supply chain? Should I buy a new car now? Is it, is it a good time to buy a new car? Uh, there are experts who say yes. There are experts who say no. But wouldn't it be nice to say to yourself, well, here's why it would make more sense to just keep my old car running for another year and then buy a car. Or alternatively, you know know what, this is a really good time to buy buy a car. Um, uh, Should you start a children's, uh, a child's um, college tuition fund as soon as your baby is born? Is that a good thing to do? Who do you ask? Who do you find out from these things? Wouldn't you know, wouldn't you like to know the basic principles that would enable you to effectively evaluate the right answer in these sorts of questions? Um, uh, what, 
what are the ways available to me to uh, to influence my child you know my child's a teenager young adult um, I still have a life experience but how can I influence my child or if I can influence my child what field should I influence my child to start thinking about my child is 15 and she doesn't know what she wants to do uh, how how do I start getting a sense of what the market like might be like in seven to ten years time um, uh, should I should I build onto my house in the neighborhood I live in or would this be a good time to change neighborhoods is my neighborhood going up or is my neighborhood going down and what are the factors in my city that influence my neighborhood um, um, oh, just oh, this uh, how should we space children we just got married and we'd like to have uh, three or four maybe five children but how should they be spaced you know, who do you ask these questions, right? These are, are, are big issues. But um, if you trust experts, ho -ho, you are in serious trouble. Uh, because experts are actually wrong more often than monkeys throwing darts at, at, at a dartboard. That's the, that is the reality. Uh, but let me tell you some of the uh, amazing predictions. Uh, experts, right? All experts, but back in 1970, so we're talking more than 50 years ago, so there's been a lot of time already to see if they were right, um, so-called experts gathered on the very first Earth Day. That's right, April 1970, wasn't it? Um, yeah, so um, let me tell you some of the marvelous um, predictions and these were the experts of the day, by the way. All the stuff I'm telling you, if you check, you will see the media repeated the stuff ad infinitum again and again and again. This is the reality. Here is the information. Um, so let's take a look and see how many predictions of these experts have actually come true since then. Um, an eminent biologist at Harvard, George Wald, uh, he stated, again, this is 1970, so it's what he said then, we've had ample time to see that, hey, guess what? His prediction didn't come true. Here it is. Civilization will end within 15 or 30 years unless immediate action is taken against problems facing mankind. Well, none of the actions he recommended have been taken, and it's now 50 years later, guess 52 years, guess what? Mankind and civilization are actually still around. Um, here's, um, oh, Washington University, bio another biologist, Washington University. These are guys who are looked up to as the experts. You had to believe what they said, because science doesn't lie, right? Washington University biologist Barry Commoner said, we are in an environmental crisis that threatens the survival of this nation and of the world as a suitable place for human habitation. Well, uh, there's a uh, freshman congressman from New York in the United States congressman called uh, AOC Cortez, and uh, she sounds exactly like Barry Commoner did in 1970. Uh, she says exactly the same. We are in an environmental crisis that threatens the survival of this nation and the world as a suitable place for human habitation. That's right. Um, how about the New York Times, right? You can always count on the New York Times. The New York Times editorial page wrote uh, on, uh, this appeared on April 23rd, 1970. Man must stop pollution and conserve his resources, not merely to enhance existence, but to save the race from intolerable deterioration and possible extinction. I mean, what can you say about this kind of stuff? I just want you to see, you cannot trust experts. Continuing, population will inevitably and completely outstrip whatever small increases in food supplies we make. This was declared with full confidence by Stanford professor Paul Ehrlich. 
and he wrote this in the April 1970 issue of Madame Zell, Mad Madame Z it's a it's a women's magazine, right? Uh, a well-known source of scientific data. Uh, he wrote, the death rate will increase until at least 100 to 200 million people per year will be starving to death during the next 10 years. He wrote this in April 1970. We passed April 1980, 1990, 2000, 2010, 2020. Uh, and guess what? The death rate will increase until 100 to 200 million people per year will be starving to death. Not happening. Nowhere. Um, how about this one? This is all Paul Ehrlich, by the way. Stanford, great Stanford professor. People pay 60000 a year and more for their children to be educated by this man. Can you believe that? By the way, there's a clue as to whether you should start a college fund for your children's tuition. Uh, most of the people who are going to die in the greatest cataclysm in the history of man have already been born, stated Stanford professor Paul Ehrlich in a 1969 essay entitled Eco-Catastrophe. Um, he said, food shortages will escalate the present level of world hunger and starvation into famines of unbelievable proportions. And he said, this will surely happen by 1980. This is true stuff. Look it up. It's real. Paul Ehrlich, E-H-R-L-I-C-H, Stanford professor. Um, more of Paul Ehrlich. He's one of my favorites. Um, he said again in 1970, he said, between 1980 and 1990, some 4 billion people, including 65 million Americans, will perish in the great die-off. Well, America's population has only increased. There has been no great die-off, and 65 million Americans have not perished of hunger, and 4 billion citizens of the planet have not perished of hunger. Uh, he said that will happen by 1980. It's now 2022. It has not yet happened. Um, Dennis Hayes, one of the main organizers uh, in a... Uh, in a spring 1970 issue of The Living Wilderness. Quote, it is already too late to avoid mass starvation. My friends, the problem in the United States of America right now is not mass starvation, it's mass obesity. But everyone then said, hey, we have to listen to the science. Science may not lie, scientists do. North Texas State University professor Peter Gunter, he wrote in 1970, I'm quoting, demographers agree unanimously on the following grim timetable. By 1975, widespread famines will begin in India. These will spread by 1992 to include all of India, Pakistan, China, and the Near East and Africa. By the year 2000, or maybe sooner, South and Central America will only exist under famine conditions. By the year 2000, 30 years from now, the entire world, with the exception of Western Europe, North America, and Australia, will be in famine. These were people we were all told know what they're talking about. They were all hailed by the press as experts. Look, I'm going to keep going a bit more. Firstly, it's entertaining and I, I find it funny. But secondly, let this be a good lesson that none of us forget. Please, don't think that people who are titled experts are telling you things that you can rely on in organizing and shaping your own life. There is a better way, and I'm going to lead you to it, of course. Life magazine. Remember famous Life magazine? It was like the biggest magazine in the United States of America. January 1970, the issue, scientists have solid experimental and theoretical evidence to support the following predictions. In one decade, urban dwellers will have to wear gas masks to survive air pollution. By 1985, air pollution will have reduced the amount of sunlight reaching the earth by one half. 
Life magazine. It was authoritative. Like, who didn't believe what they read in Life magazine? Me. I didn't. Because I know this fundamental principle. So January 1970, the issue of January 70, Life says scientists know beyond any doubt that by 1980, people who live in cities will have to wear gas masks to survive pollution. By 1985, air pollution will have reduced the amount of sunlight reaching the earth by one half. Well, that would mean there shouldn't be any global warming, right? Well, that's true, because back then they were saying that temperatures are going down cal calamitously. Now where temperatures are going up, so I presume there's plenty sunlight reaching the earth, right? As a matter of fact, where I am right now, you could call it a heat wave. Temperatures are approaching 100 degrees. Quite a lot of sunlight reaching the earth. But in Life magazine of January 1970, they said by 1985, let alone 2022, by 1985, half the sunlight will no longer reach Earth. Um, there was an academic ecologist called Kenneth Watt. Time magazine said, at the present rate of nitrogen buildup, it's only a matter of time before light will be filtered out of the atmosphere and none of our land will be usable. That's what... Time magazine said in uh, 50, more than 50 years ago. Um, again, Barry Commoner, um, he said, freshwater fish in all American rivers and lakes will be gone. They will be suffocated. Uh, Paul, Paul Ehrlich again in 1970, air pollution is certainly going to take hundreds of thousands of lives in the next few years alone. Ehrlich said that 200,000 Americans would die during 1973 in New York and Los Angeles. The man is, I mean, call him brave or reckless, but in 1970 he predicted that only three years later, New York and Los Angeles would lose 200,000 citizens to death by air pollution. Um, in Audubon magazine, the May 1970 issue, um, Pollution has substantially reduced the life expectancy of people born since 1945. Ehrlich warned that Americans born since 1946 now have a life expectancy of only 49 years. And he predicted that this pattern would continue and it would reach a life expectancy of 42 years by 1980. Um, life expectancy for men in the United States at the moment uh, is calculated by the CDC to the, whatever extent you trust the Center for Disease Control after the COVID calamity. I don't know they should be trusted at all, but um, they uh, are saying life expectancy is approaching 80 years for men. Yet in 1970, uh, they predicted, yes, uh, 42 years would be life expectancy. You see, um, these people like calamity and disaster, right? That's what's going on. Because people pay attention if you come out with bad news. And attention is how academics, and yes, that includes scientists, thrive. Their, uh, their grants and uh, funding is always dependent on attention. Um, ecologist Kenneth Watt, by the year 2000, we will be using up crude oil at such a rate that there won't be any more crude oil. You'll drive up to the pump and say, fill her up, buddy. And he'll say, I'm very sorry, there just isn't any. Um, I don't have to tell you that global oil production is now considerably annually, on an annualized basis, considerably higher than it was in 1970. So it's not that there's less oil as they predicted. Uh, there's actually more. Uh, we're pumping about 50% more oil uh, than we did in 1970. So... Uh, uh, Scientific American, right? Credible magazine, you'd think, published um, that uh, humanity would totally run out of copper by the year 2000. Also, lead, zinc, tin, gold, and silver would be gone before 1990. Well, not only is gold not gone, but as I said earlier, the price of gold is not reflecting any shortage whatsoever. 
uh, one, a United States senator by the name of Gaylord Nelson in 1970. He wrote in Look Magazine, right? Look Magazine, you know what that is. Um, they he says, scientists believe that in 25 years, somewhere between 75 and 80% of all the species of living animals will be extinct. Right, that's what's going on, right? Uh, let's go back to Paul Ehrlich, 1975. Paul Ehrlich says, since more than nine-tenths of the original tropical rainforests will be removed in most areas within the next 30 years, it is expected that half of the organisms in these areas will vanish with it. Hasn't happened. Um, they, uh, Kenneth Watt warned about a pending ice age. Uh, right, it's hard to believe, right? Only 52 years ago, a, a scientist who was published, I mean, this guy, you Google this guy's name, he shows up thousands and thousands of times. He was quoted everywhere. This guy was the guru of ecology and meteorology and science. Listen to what he said in 1970. The world has been chilling sharply for about 20 years, getting colder. If these trends continue, the world will be about four degrees colder in 1990 and 11 degrees colder in 2000. This is twice as much as it would take to put us into a new ice age. Disaster, calamity, global cooling. That's right. That's what people were believing back then. And today, foolish people are believing their predictions about global warming, climate change, and subsequent calamity. It's it's unbelievable. Uh, all right, you know what? I should probably I should probably stop with that. Um, these these predictions are absolutely disastrous. They 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 just nonsense and. But it's all experts who made them. Every one of them was made by an acknowledged and acclaimed expert. Don't worry. I know you're thinking to yourself, well, what are we supposed to do then? You can't trust any. Not so fast. Yes, I can suggest somebody you could trust. And if you want to know his name before I'm willing to disclose it, while I'm talking, get out your wallet or your purse, open it up and find your driver's license. If you look at your driver's lines carefully, you'll see a photograph and the name of a person. That is the person. I want you to acquire the, being, the means of being able to trust and rely on. That's right. That is the person who should be making all final decisions having to do with your life. And what's more, there is a way to equip you to be doing just that. Uh, a psychologist professor, psychology professor at Berkeley University, uh, Philip Tetlock, did a really interesting study. Here's what he did. He got hold of 284 experts in all sorts of areas, uh, politics, science, weather, all 284 of them. And uh, the only requirement was they all had to make their living by being experts. So they all had to be people who are quoted or are interviewed on television. These are names of people you will see. If you watch the news, you watch television, you will see many of the people of the 284, 284 experts on Philip Tetlock's list. Um, and he started this in 1983, by the way, and he was willing to put a lot of time into this. Basically, he wanted to get predictions from them, and then he was going to wait to see how those predictions played out. And good man, Philip Tetlock was in no hurry. He waited for over 20 years before he decided to start studying and evaluating the predictions made by all these 284 experts. You know how many predictions he gathered? 82,361. In other words, each one of these experts had produced many, many, many predictions, and the total number of predictions he studied, 82,361. How many of them came true? Well, so few that he says had he had monkeys throwing dots 
at yes no answers he would have got a better response rate in other words statistically random would have given better results than these experts they were overwhelmingly wrong isn't that something if you just guess an answer right you got a 50 50 chance of being right or wrong these experts who made 82,361 predictions 20 years later Philip Tetlock Professor Tetlock from Berkeley looks at the predictions and discovers you would have thought right 50% of them should be right about 30% or less turn out to be right so you'd have done better throwing darts at a board but people love experts that's what's going on by the way when you uh, uh, when he, he tried to make it better by limiting experts to predictions in their own fields because very often you know experts make predictions in all kinds of fields and he thought it would get much better at least he'd then be able to say well if you follow and listen to an acclaimed expert in his own field well the results should be much better than random no unfortunately not so uh, i am very persuaded i am completely persuaded already that um yeah experts it's meaningless so what is the answer my dear friends what is the answer well, the answer is, the answer is very simply, the answer is that um, correct prediction, whether it's about matters having to do with, with your family or, or with your lives, uh, predictions all have to do, not with facts, not with being an expert, but with being wise. Or in other words, as we say on the Rabbi Daniel Lappin show, by understanding how the world really works. That's wisdom. And if you know how the world really works, why then your chances of being able to get predictions right goes way up. Right. But wisdom... You know, what is wisdom? Well, before I give you uh, an insight into what wisdom is, knowing how the world really works, how do you get that? Other than being part of the Rabbi Daniel Lappin show? Well, here's an example of something that isn't. And again, this is hot off the press. If you happen to be watching this show or listening to this show in the middle of 2022, then this is brand new. If you're listening to it much later, uh, well, you'll know by then how this is all played out. But here's something that is definitely not wise. Um, medical schools around the United States, they're all governed, they're all organized by the Association of American Medical Colleges, the AAMC. And uh, this represents the country's medical schools, it advises them, and it influences the uh, committee on, Committees on Medical Education, the national accreditor that sets medical school standards. So when the AMC tells schools to revise how they teach, America's future physicians will be obliged to listen and obey. And they've just re re uh, released a report which somebody inside the medical school establishment sent me a copy of secretly and um, it is now um, clear that physicians who are teaching at medical schools and men and women who are aspiring doctors have to undergo political re-education they have to become fluent in the concept of intersectionality, which, as you know, is the overlapping systems of oppression and discrimination that communities face based on race, gender, ethnicity, and ability. Medical students who don't 
master these topics won't pass and become doctors. They also have to uh, show expertise in the intersectionality of a patient's multiple identities. Not personality disorders, but um, multiple forms of oppression and privilege. Um, they are going to have to learn, aspiring doctors are expected now to learn and practice that race is a social construct that is a cause of health and health care inequities, not a risk factor for disease. Um, racial and ethnic groups do in fact have different proclivities for certain diseases. Um, the uh, dangerous BRCA gene mutation is found much more in Ashkenazic Jewish women than other groups, and so on and so forth. There's half a dozen easily well-known situations or conditions that are more prevalent among people of different skin colors and different racial groups and different gender groups, and that now has to be banished. Right now, it is only a question of oppression caused by discrimination based on race, gender, class, ethnicity, and ability. So, uh, most young people who pursue a career in medicine do so because they want to help people. They want to cure people. Now, they're going to be taught that an intricate web of social, behavioral, economic, and environmental factors, including access to quality education and housing, have greater influence on patients' health than physicians do. Okay, uh, you got to be aware that when you are on the lookout for medical treatment, be aware that if your doctor is a young doctor who's just recently graduated, then he has had his or her head filled with this stuff. And that means that their diagnosis and their treatment will partially be based on very unwise factors. Sad, but true. Very real. Um, so, what is wisdom? Wisdom is a set of principles, what I call timeless truths, by means of which you can see the world. It's a set of lenses that make up a window through which you can see the world. And if you look at the world through these lenses, your predictions will be much more correct than if you don't. If you look at the world through these lenses, you will be looking at the world quite differently from the way everyone else does. But you won't be subject to the wrong-headed and embarrassing predictions that I read you a number of examples from earlier on. And so uh, let me give you just a few examples so you get the idea of what we're talking about. Uh, one example is that um, when things are wrong in your life, who is most responsible? I can give you a clue. This is painful stuff, but I respect you as a happy warrior enough to feel confident that you'd rather hear the truth than have me massage you with warm butter, right? You want to know who's mostly responsible for the problems in your life? Here's a clue. Open your wallet, open your purse, pull out your driver's license, take a look at the photograph, you'll see a name next to the photograph. That's the name of the villain the scoundrel most responsible for whatever problems you have in your life. 100%? No, nothing is 100%, just most. Got financial problems today? 99% because of bad choices and decisions you made yesterday. Now, this is not at all the way the world out there looks at stuff. Be aware that you've got friends and relatives whose natural intuitive instinct is that things go wrong, not because of anything I did, but things are wrong in my life because of outside forces like racism, like sexism, like anti-Semitism, uh, like intersectionality, like uh, capitalism, like um, 
whatever it is. People believe this. And so people like that wake up every morning getting out of bed saying, I'm a victim. What, what chance do I have of succeeding with all these terrifying and faceless forces opposing me and sabotaging me in every possible way? That's what people believe. But you will be wiser and you will have a better sense of how the world really works when you realize that having been created in the image of God, you have agency in your life. You have power. You can actually affect your own life. Is it easy? No, of course not. Much easier to blame the world around you, to blame all kinds of other forces. But the reality is you and I have the ability to change our own lives. So that, that would be one very um, important one. Uh, here's another one. Uh, you don't have the right to anyone else's property. Wait, but how about, I was going to say, I, I've been dis disadvantaged. As a, no, you have no right to anyone else's property, period. That's another example of how the world really works. You're looking at, at the world another way. You're going to end up with confused results and wrong predictions and worst of all, bad decisions for your life and that of the people you care about. Those of the people you care about, I should have said. Um, uh, <laughs> here's an obvious one, right? This one is so simple. Um, men and women are different. Almost every cell in your body has chromosomes in it which proclaim that you are either XX female or XY male. That's it! Again, very different from what you're going to hear out there. But if you want to make smart predictions, accurate predictions, wise decisions about your life, then you need to know that simple reality. And so all kinds of questions, very real questions, questions that do matter, questions... Um, husband and wife both have jobs and uh, both are now um, being relocated and so only one is going to be able to keep their job. Um, either we move where the husband's job is moving him to or we move to where the wife's job is moving her to. What is the preference? Well, the husband's all things being equal. I mean if there's a huge disparity of income then uh, we have another set of problems because marriages in which the wife dramatically out earns the husband are not of long duration. That's unarguable. It's a, just a reality. It's again how the world really works. And so all things being equal, um, if we can keep the husband working rather than the wife, that's better for the marriage, much better for the marriage. Many foolish women cannot accept that. What do I mean by a foolish woman? A foolish woman is somebody who uh, riles at everything. Well, this is sexist. That's sexist. This is sexist. I'll tell you what I, I say to uh, women like that. I say, look, um, I don't know exactly how old you are, but um, you only have a short period of time, a relatively short period of time, to mother a child of fertility. If you're 30, you got another 15 years approximately. That's it. Me, I'm older than you, a lot older than you. I could still father a child. Sexist! Men can father children. Men can remain fertile much longer. Sexist! So yeah, call it sexist if you like. But for how, how long are you going to waste your life waving a defiant fist against reality? Because... Wisdom and how the world really works are very tied to reality. And, and so it is. There, there, there are many, many, many uh, sets. I mean, there's, uh, in order to function effectively in the world, there's probably uh, about a hundred, maybe less, uh, timeless truths that you have to know in order to become a wise person. 
You don't have to go to university for these things. You don't have to go to uh, college. You don't even have to go to kindergarten. Uh, these are things that are taught in a totally different way. Uh, in, in my case, these emerge from Scripture. The entire purpose of Scripture. If you want it in one sentence, it's God's way of giving His children understanding of the timeless truths that explain how the world really works. I'm going to give you an example, and uh, with, that, with that we'll have to leave it, but I want you to understand that when I teach Scrolling Through Scripture, which is an online course at rabbidaniellappin.com, and by the way, you can even watch a half, uh, uh, you can watch an entire uh, lesson of that free right now. Just go online, go on to rabbidaniellappin.com. But when I teach, and that's like uh, 10 hours of teaching the first 34 verses of Genesis, I'm teaching how the world really works. I'm not teaching theology. I'm not teaching Bible history. I'm not teaching comparative religion. I'm not teaching any of that. All that waste of time. The things you need to know for your life are how the world really works. The timeless truths of ancient Jewish wisdom. Because they apply to every single human being. And that's why I teach scrolling through scripture. Let me give you an example. And this is a, a typical scrolling through scripture lesson. Um, some of you might remember if you're if if you know if you're not born in the last few years, uh, you might remember when they introduced the 75 mile 70, 55 mile an hour speed limit. Pardon me. Uh, it was 1974. And there was um, the gas shortage, and uh, you'll remember those those years. Um, it was post Richard Nixon, uh, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, and the interest rates are 18 percent, and gasoline lines all over the place. So, in order to save gasoline, the brilliant legislators in Capitol Hill came up with a 55 mile an hour speed limit. Now. Uh, my question to you is, and I'm, I'm going to divide laws into two categories, so bear with me, concentrate with me, right? Concentrate, focus, like a laser beam, for just a few minutes, and then I'll give you a rest. Two categories of laws, descriptive laws, proscriptive laws. Proscriptive laws are some faceless bureaucrat came up with a law and it gets passed. Actually, faceless bureaucrats usually cover their rear ends far too carefully and they always pass laws by committee, never individuals. So, uh, so it's always going to be a committee. Um, a descriptive law is a law that describes how the world really works. Now, what is the 55 mile an hour speed limit, which, by the way, did not even save one half of 1% of oil in the United States of America. And so uh, about, was it 10 years later, um, I forget when it was. They uh, they upped it. Uh, they upped it uh, to something higher, higher. But some bureaucrat licked his pencil and said, uh, "Yeah, 55 miles an hour. I think we'll we'll make that the national speed limit." And for many years, that was the national speed limit. Why? A bureaucrat said so. Now. If you would violate that speed limit, which I did all the time, and if you drove more than 55 miles an hour, then um, would you suddenly disintegrate? Would you fly apart in a, in, in a, in a fireball of, of matter? No. If you didn't get caught, everything was fine. Do you see? That is what is called a proscriptive law. It's prescribed. Um, that income tax returns have to be filed by April 15th. Proscriptive or descriptive? Proscriptive. Somebody could have said April the 17th or December 31st. They came up with April the 15th. I don't know why they came up with it, but there's nothing, there's nothing written in granite. There's nothing in the world of the cosmos which decrees April the 15th. Somebody came up with it. That's another proscriptive law. Um, that you have to take off your shoes when you walk through um, 
airport security lines. Just a proscriptive law, right? No, the TSA, to my knowledge, has never prevented a single terrorist attack in, since the history of its formation, which was one of the many mistakes that President George W. Bush made. TSA, what a disaster. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's like the terminal stages of a bad marriage, right? Too much hostility with too much intimacy all at the same time. So uh, these are all uh, proscriptive laws. Somebody prescribed them, that's all. H how about a descriptive law? Let me give you an example of a descriptive law. I, I said the weather's very hot right now. And again, by the way, I'm, I don't know if you can hear the excavators at work, but I can see the guys at work. Temperature's nearly 100 degrees where I am at the present moment. They're working. They haven't stopped once. You've got you to be ad admiring of this. It's incredible. Air conditioning. You know why air conditioning works? Because of two laws in physics. We call them Boyle's Law and Charles's Law. So Boyle's Law and Charles' Law states that when gases expand, they cool off. Their temperature goes down. What sort of law is that? Proscriptive or descriptive? Is there a bureaucrat at the United Nations who can change that law? No, there's a bureaucrat who can change the speed limit law. There's a bureaucrat who can change fi tax filing on April 15th law, but not this. Uh, gravity. If you step out of a window on the 20th floor of a building, you will enjoy a very exciting short journey to the sidewalk. Unfortunately, the end of the journey will be fatal. Is that a law that can be changed? No. That's descriptive. There are some laws that descriptive. They are descriptive. They describe how the world really works. You know how the world really works? That when um, gases expand, they cool off. That's why we have refrigeration. That's why we have air conditioning, talking of the temperature because of Boyle's Law and Charles' Law. Gravity, another law like that. Well, how's about another law? There's a law in Scripture which we can find in uh, Leviticus chapter 18 and Leviticus chapter 20. And what they say is that a man is not allowed to marry his aunt, he's not allowed to marry his father's, brother, his father's sister or mother's sister, and a woman is not allowed to marry her nephew. What sort of law is that? Descriptive or proscriptive? Remember, a descriptive law has real-world consequences if you violate it. A proscriptive law only has consequences if you're caught. So, what is this? That a woman shouldn't marry her nephew and a man shouldn't marry his niece, even though uh, it's legal in many, many places. So um, you might say, well, maybe it's genetic. The Bible doesn't want genetic problems between people who are too close to one another and with their offspring. But wait a second, if that were so, then wouldn't you agree that a man should not marry his niece? Remember I told you a man mustn't marry his aunt. But a man is allowed to marry his niece. And a woman is allowed to marry her uncle, where the genetic connection is exactly the same as a woman married to her nephew and a man married to his aunt. So it can't be a genetic problem. And so therefore, are we looking at a proscriptive or a descriptive law? What do you think? The answer has to do with understanding the timeless truths about marriage. The timeless truths about marriage, one of them is that a woman likes to be able to look up to her husband, and a man likes to be looked up to by his wife. We see a physical reflection of that spiritual reality in that marriages tend to be mostly between taller men and shorter women, even though the actual statistical ratio of male-female heights are not as high as the marriage ratio. In other words, 
men choose to marry women who are shorter than they and women choose men who are taller than them at far more than the biological height ratio would suggest. That's a reflection of a spiritual desire of a man to be looked up to by his woman and a woman to actually desire to be able to look up to her man. Now, in families, remember families are supposed to be multi-generational, right? Ideally, a family has grandparents and parents and children. That's, that's the, the basic structure of a family. And that's the ideal structure you want. You want such good people, such people who are, are so functional and normal that they raise functional and normal children, who get married and raise functional and normal grandchildren, and everybody is connected to one another. And family get-togethers have three generations there. That's the ideal. And that's the way it is in many places. You go into many homes around the world, and uh, there'll be a picture of the grandparents on the, on the mantelpiece or on the wall. Sometimes they're pictures of the great-grandparents. Because the multi-generational aspect of family is very important. There isn't time in today's show, that would need a show by itself as to why the multi-generational aspect is so important. But just one teeny-weeny little part of that is that family traditions, family culture, family values are transmitted down from the grandparents' generation to the parents' generation to the children. And when that is coherent, multi-generationally, the task of raising great children is made far, far easier. And so if you're somebody getting married today, you need to be talking to your future spouse or your current spouse. You need to be talking not about being great husbands and wives and not just about being great parents one day, but you need to already be talking about being great grandparents one day. In other words, keeping the multi-generational aspect of a family in your heart. And it's never too late to work on this, by the way. If you've got kids and you've got a bad relationship with your parents, fix it up now. It's not too late. It will be too late soon, but it's not too late now. So do something about it. Make sure you can restore multi-generationality in your family. And herein lies a clue to my question to you, which is whether aunts, not, uh, women not being able to marry their nephews, is that descriptive or proscriptive? D proscriptive meaning, oh well, Moses said that 3,000 years ago, you can ignore it. Or descriptive in that, hey, ignore it, but there'll be a price to pay. It's inescapable. So, uh, you know, like gravity. So um, what's going on here? What's going on here is that uh, very simple. It's all intended to improve the chances of a marriage working. When society has no marriages, when marriages collapse, things are really, really problematic. Fertility goes down. Your economic vitality and the economic security of your children is harmed by a lowering population. Because for an economy to flourish, the population must be pyramid shaped. There must be more people in your children's generation than in yours for this to work. It's one of the great secrets of economics that people don't really like. And so, um, but nonetheless, very important to understand. So uh, you, you need marriages to flourish in a society, but marriages are very delicate. And the consequences of marriages going bad are so serious and the delights and joys of a good marriage are so wonderful that you want to use every single minuscule opportunity to enhance the likelihood of successful marriage. Well, remember, if I marry my aunt, she is one generation closer to grandparents than I am. In other words, her parents are my grandparents. And so if we talk about family trans, transmission, transmission of values, I might say, gosh, I think grandpa used to do this. She says, come on, who are you telling? I grew up in his house. I was his daughter. I know what he used to do. And I am demoted. That's, not, that's ideally not what my wife wants, not what I want. But if I marry my niece, now I'm a generation closer to grandpa than she is. And that's a better way for things to work. Marriages work better, by the way, when husbands are wiser than wives. When wives look at their husbands and say, you know what, my husband really knows how the world really works.
I got a stupid doctoral degree in psychology and I don't know anything. My husband never went to college. He works on a construction site and he drives an excavator. <laughs> but he knows how the world really works. That works much better for a marriage. And so, uh, my dear happy warriors, I've told you a lot of things in today's show. Uh, maybe I've squashed too many things into, into one show. But I want to urge you, please realize that how the world really works is the key to making successful decisions and wise predictions about the world. You really have to know it. I'm just looking to see if, I, if there's anything else I'd plan to tell you about, but it's, I think enough. Enough is enough, and uh, I've given you more than enough for today's show, right? I think I've taken up more than enough of your time. Um, I, uh, I hope you enjoy the, uh, the video version that, that this show is available in video as well as audio on YouTube. And uh, I hope you enjoy that and like that very much. I also hope that you will go to RabbiDanielLappin.com and uh, start making use of the resources. Ancient Jewish wisdom, right? You'll find uh, 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 online programs of scrolling through scripture. You will find uh, online programs of financial prosperity. These are all practical, life-affirming programs that will fill you with the information that allows you to make better decisions and more accurate predictions. Because these do not depend on expertise. They do not depend on college degrees. They depend on knowing the timeless truths of how the world really works. And I, there may be other sources, but I know no better source than the scriptural teachings of ancient Hebrew wisdom that I share with you. Maybe there are other sources, but this is one that really works, and what's more, has worked for a very long period of time for a very broad variety of different Jews of every race, gender, color, background, everything. Because all you need to know in order to succeed in this world, to succeed with your family, which means sexually, economically, financially, socially, it means health-wise. Yes, health is also part of this. And even in a relationship with the boss up there, which is also a very valuable part of successful living, all of that is available through the secrets of ancient Hebrew wisdom, that it is my sacred mission to share with each and every happy warrior, to do everything I can to give you more effective tools for making your life as successful as possible. Thank you so much for being part of the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show. I appreciate it very much. And I wish you a wonderful week, onwards and upwards, with your family and your finances, your faith and your fitness, and your friendships. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.